Welcome to season two of the Crypto Pulse podcast, your ultimate guide to the world of crypto, Bitcoin, and world economics. We're here to guide you through the crypto universe with thought provoking topics, in depth knowledge, and information to help you make informed decisions. We'll also be interviewing some of the best minds in the industry, such as CEOs of crypto projects, traders, economists, authors, and development teams from around the globe. And now for the episode. This episode is brought to you by Yield App and daily compounding interest on your digital assets with its intuitive web platform. And don't forget to refer your friends to earn extra rewards. Visit yield.app for more information. Hello and welcome back to the Crypto Pulse podcast for another one of our weekly episodes about crypto and macroeconomics. Mm. Ben, that was only the second attempt to doing the intro this week, so um, I'm really pleased mm. with myself. Well done. Yeah, usually it's third time a charm. Uh, yeah, no, what a what a great week it's been in the crypto and blockchain world. It's been a great um, week. Well, yeah, I mean, pretty. Are completely... you looking at the screen upside down? <laughs> <laughs> Are you colorblind? <laughs> I was. I was, I think I was being sarcastic. Actually, it's been a horrible week, um, mm. but eventful as always. Well, I mean, where to even begin? Maybe we should begin with current market prices like they are now. I'd like to remind those of the wise words of Uncle Michael Saylor <laughs> and his advice he gave in March of last year, where he said, Take all of your money and buy Bitcoin. Figure out how to borrow more money and buy more Bitcoin. Go and mortgage your house and mortgage your business and buy Bitcoin with it. The most solid money in the universe. And if you didn't know, that was actually Ben and not Michael Saylor. <laughs> it's it's completely un it's uncanny. I know. Um, I mean, I've actually you, been filling in for him on Bloomberg. There's no second best crypto asset. There's a crypto asset. It's called Bitcoin, right? It's probably a good time to talk about our conspiracy theory with Michael Saylor and Jordan Peterson. Oh yeah, I think they're the same person. Hey, that's a bloody killer idea. I'm pretty. I'm pretty convinced pretty that Jordan. Much Sounds yeah, insane, Jordan, right? Jordan Peterson is very like, and uh, you have to ask yourself the question. He's a bit more Canadian <laughs> than Michael Saylor, but they've got, uh, and they also share a voice with Bill Gates. I'm not long or short. Uh, <laughs> Same voice. That That's a bit worrying, you know, because mm. I quite like Peterson and Saylor. Don't yeah. agree with everything that they always say about everything, but yeah. I don't really like Bill Gates and don't really like Microsoft very much. And no. I don't like the fact he's buying all this farmland up in America, but maybe that's another episode we could do. Yeah. So we're going to be think, doing some episodes around um, people in the b prolific people in the crypto space. Although I probably don't really want to give him any more attention than he already gets because he'll just feed Who's his Bill Gates. Uh, M megalomaniac and narcissistic personality that's a very very good point yeah but to, to but to the michael saylor point had you taken his advice back in march uh, yeah. and had you mortgaged your house and sold your business and used it to buy the most solid money on earth you'd probably be panicking today uh, because the price of Bitcoin, as we record this episode today, is at 21,000 US dollars, which is um, the lowest it's been uh, since, I believe, December of 2020. Um, we're now back to the previous cycle highs of the 11th of December 2017. Mm. Um, and, and typically with Bitcoin and these four year uh, cycle rules, we never typically dip below the previous cycle highs. Um, and that that tends to be the rule that you know most of these analysts play by. However, uh, with the sort of economic headwinds that we've got at the moment, I wouldn't be surprised if Bitcoin breaks that rule and we dip below. Um, bears are absolutely in charge. Um, we sort of hit our double top on the 8th of November of 21. And since then, we've tumbled over 60 percent. So it's fascinating to watch. I mean, a lot of this has been driven by the collapse of Luna Terra, which we spoke about on the show a couple of weeks ago. Um, they obviously had to liquidate a billion dollars worth of Bitcoin to save the uh, USD peg. Um, and this week, of course, we've had the news about Celsius, which, yeah. um, you know, were one of the more robust um, robust companies in the space, and they they seem to be having a very very similar problem. Uh, they Things closed. have really been heating up, haven't they? They but have. But um, but um, yeah, we're dialing up the temperature on Celsius. I think it's get and it's getting worse. Um, and the communication hasn't been particularly clear. But we're going to talk about that in more detail on the show later. 
I think also it's important when we look at crypto and we try to do this on the show is to bring this into the context of the the global macro picture. We had the Fed's meeting earlier this week where they talked about their interest rate hikes. Now, we they typically in the last few meetings have been raising by 50 basis points. Uh, the 50 basis points has um, that was expected to continue throughout the summer as a method of combating rising inflation. Now, uh, the CPI print last week was much, much higher than expected. It came in at 8.6%, which was 30 basis points um, higher than was expected, which suggests that the Fed actually haven't got a real handle on what's going on. So whilst most people expected that would, you know, they would probably uh, up the ante with interest rates. I, I don't think people were expecting 75 basis points, but hey, we're, we're there. And uh, initially the markets reacted quite well, but subsequently um, there has been a massive sell-off. If you look at any of the indexes this week, the NASDAQ, uh, the S&P 500, the FTSE, they've all suffered um, and are actually down big on the week. I think as um, people now are, you know, investors and funds are, are really kind of starting to price in a global recession, which could last anywhere between sort of 12 months and two, three years. If you tuned into the Fed's meeting this week, um, Powell said that they probably don't anticipate cutting interest rates until 2024. They may have to reverse on these decisions, but, uh, you know, intra inflation is spiraling out of control. In the UK this week, they announced that we expect inflation to hit 11% by October, which of course is higher than it's been in the last 40, 50 years. Yeah, 11% is absolutely outrageous. I mean, this is what happens when you like like debase your currency. Um, we've seen this in other countries previously and you know, in other times throughout history. It's very, very concerning. And a lot of people don't actually realise that handouts and free money that we've had over the last couple of years through COVID, that those are the things that have primarily caused this situation yeah. because it's also affected supply chains and supply chains affect food supply. And, you know, all this crap, going back to America, all this crap that Biden spouts about blaming Russia for rising gas prices, blaming Russia for rising wheat prices. That's just a fraction of the story. The problem I have with all of this is that I think the our, our, fi our global fiscal policy is broken and it yeah. serves the elite. And I'm talking about the elite right at the top, the multi-billionaires, the ones that are yep. lobbying world government to do certain things. And yeah. I put Bill Gates in that category. Um, it's not the it's not the middle class. It's not the wealthy. But unfortunately, this all hits the working class and it hits the middle class. And and I think our government, in some ways, are almost just powerless to do anything about it because it's bigger than just whether it's a Labour government or a Conservative government or who's steering you know UK policy. Because we're all wrapped mm. up in a world economic system that really isn't working very well. And I don't quite know where this is going to end up. Um, but this yeah. is one of the reasons that I fell in love with the philosophy of Bitcoin in 2017 when I discovered it and un started to understand things like Austrian economics and started to understand um, mm. um, uh, the decentralization of money from government. And um, I think we could probably do a whole episode on that one, actually, because we, we absolutely something can. has to change. You know, people can't afford to continue to to do this and yeah. you know we're we're both quite well insulated really you mm -hmm. know we've got a couple of businesses i wouldn't say that we're wealthy but we're okay and we felt the pinch with stuff so i can only yeah. imagine what it must be like with um you know young family and for people that are maybe on one income or two lower incomes and it's just just not sustainable but anyway rant over uh yeah it's it's a a really a good point i mean i'd, I'd kind of like to just add some context to the numbers in terms of the US um, because we talk about money printing mm. all the time and we talk about this disparity between the wealthy and the poor um, in mm. America. Now, as part of the um, COVID 
recovery plan, there was almost $5.2 trillion, which were printed as part of the COVID rescue plan. $1,200 were, um, w- was given out as part of a stimulus check, which left something like $3 trillion, which essentially ended up going to the rich. Um, the billionaires in America added $1.8 trillion to their net worth throughout the COVID pandemic. So you've got this major disparity. And as you rightly said, money flows towards money. And it it, it, it sort of reeks of a broken capitalist system um, where, where actually there are no checks and balances in place that make sure that, you know, the poorer in society get their fair share. And as you rightly said, with Bitcoin and decentralization, it does go some way to solving some of those problems. I don't think it's a perfect system. And I think we've seen that with DeFi um, in the last couple of weeks. Um, but as an experiment, as a thought experiment, I think it's interesting. And um, and there's definitely something in it. So we'll see how it plays out. I think the option to not have to be always in your native country's currency is really important and to yeah not you know okay so oh we think the pound's going to fall we'll buy the dollar or the euro that doesn't really make an enormous amount of difference but to have mm. something that everyone has access to um is great and uh, yeah i know bitcoin prices have fallen and this is still a very very new a new technology and a new network and a new idea and it's really being driven prices are being driven by um the retail investor market the market's very small and i mm. remember somebody giving me this analogy once which is when the when the ocean is rough when there's bad weather the small dinghies and the small boats move up and down the most and they're the most volatile. Whereas the mm. big cruisers, the big ships like your S and P 500s and your footsies, etc., they do feel it and there is volatility, but it's, it's way less. And, and also some stocks are like 60, 70% down as well. So yeah, um, Netflix, Coinbase. I mean, Coinbase is down nearly 80% from its IPO. Right. Peloton, famously, you know, we've yeah. seen. Um, so th- it made me um, it made me laugh this week because I've been watching a little bit of Bloomberg, which is, mm. is something that you and I have both started my, to watch. Yeah, my yeah. favourite. It, it's interesting. It's very it's very America first. It's like, you know, they they love the dollar, don't they? They you know, they really do think the dollar's the king. Um I do. You, you know, fair enough, that's their point of view. Um but they were really, really shitting on Bitcoin. Um and who's the old guy with the glasses on there that always moans about crypto? Oh, I, can, you know? I can never I can never remember his name, but he looks like a Winston Churchill type character. Right. And he's quite entertaining, he's quite old school. Mm. But he was saying, like, what is this Bitcoin thing? This is ridiculous. People People are underwater people have lost money and i'm like yep. i was like honestly over the last 10 20 years people have lost more purchasing power holding their dollars than they have bitcoin and as michael Saylor right. says nobody's ever lost money holding bitcoin for more than four years so yeah. it's just something to bear in mind when you're looking at someone like the mainstream commentary on on the bitcoin price you're absolutely right i was speaking to an entrepreneur the other day who was trying to explain um who, who was telling me how he explains inflation to people that don't mm. just don't get it and he likened it to starting a journey in your car knowing and the sat nav is telling you that the journey is 100 miles long uh, as you start getting closer to your destination out of nowhere uh, another 50 miles of road appears and it's that and it's that sort of unknowing and that lack of control over your destiny which is essentially what happens with money you know the value of your money folds in half every year you don't have control over it it's the governments that choose when to or the central banks i should say that choose to print more um so it's a, it's a slippery ladder Another sailor quote, which I loved from his interview, I think it was on Lex Friedman's podcast. He said that governments do two things, which is so they print money, which is um, inflationary and they spend spend things that um, that are inflammatory. So <laughs> inflationary <laughs> and inflammatory. <laughs> Um, Sounds and I think, excellent. I, I think Lex said, "I'll oh, give give uh, give our economy, our world economists, uh, like a grade on on their their policies." And I think he gave them something like a D or an E, you know, like you would give you know a paper or an essay. I like it at university. So, should we move on to um, our hot topic of the week? It is a hot topic. This is the Celsius network fiasco, which of course has been the big news in the crypto space this week. Oh, that's hot. 
There's that. Of course, Binance on Monday halted withdrawals of Bitcoin for several hours after crypto lender Celsius also blocked customers from pulling funds from its platform, citing extreme market conditions. Uh, these extreme market conditions were due to Celsius facing a liquidity crisis, meaning they were lacking withdrawable assets. At the moment, we have no idea what the future fate of Celsius will be nor the fate of its $25 billion that it allegedly holds in assets. But if the recent Terra USD debacle is anything to go off of, the future does not look good for Celsius. The question is, how does something like this happen? Um, and it's actually due to several things. So at Otteroo on Twitter has a really, really detailed thread about this and a YouTuber that goes by the name of Coffeezilla also does a quite good video on the subject as well. Um, but in short, the main reason Celsius crashed is due to consistent doubt and worry from users that Celsius yield on stable coins was too good to be true, which mm. is something which everyone has been saying about these kind of yield, um, these, these yielding uh, platforms, right? I mean, it was the um, anchor platform for Terra that mm. was offering something ludicrous, like, you know, an annual yield, I think, of 20%. I didn't, I didn't ever use it because it seemed too good to be true. And also in the crypto space, it's like there are opportunities to get 10,000% returns if you find the right projects. Of course, there's not a lot of liquidity on those. But if you go yeah. in with small positions, you can you can win big. Yeah, and have, um, have self-custody of it so you don't have that counterparty risk, which... Totally. Um, it seems like a lot of YouTubers in the crypto space have uh, forgotten about ca counterparty risk in some regard. <laughs> yeah, um, there's quite a, there's there's one big one in particular that's now uh, trying to sue Celsius. So that that's going to be interesting to see how that plays out. It is just too good to be true, and you kind of look at where where is that yield coming from. Mm. And you know anyone that's been involved in tradfi over the last twenty years will know that you just can't provide those those kinds of return uh, in a sustainable way. Um, but uh, the uh, CEO of Celsius, Alex Machinsky, actually was villainizing traditional finance and painting Celsius as an angelic and philanthropic light, um, quite arrogant as well. You know, these uh, there's something about these sort of billionaire founders that just think that the sun shines out of their ass and think they're completely impervious and so so, so arrogant um I, I hate to say it but they they almost deserve the oncoming storm um they they deserve to be sort of in the firing line and to have to answer to the regulators yeah um a lot of them don't have any humility or, or self-awareness or uh, empathy which is probably characteristics of what what's that the is it the dark triad personalities you've got um narcissist uh megalomaniac i, I yeah. can't remember anyway but they probably they probably fall into into one or two of those categories i would i would imagine and you're right there is a, a certain type of character that you get in this space that i've, I've founded these and i think that it's it's one of uh, one of the downsides of of this space is it does seem to attract these nutcases <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, it was a, it, an interesting comparison is that Bernie Madoff in, um, tw uh, when was it? I mean, I think it was in the 90s. He he was uh, sentenced to prison for right. losing his investors something like $40 billion. And Do Kwan, the founder of Terra Luna, lost $60 billion and a week later then just founded Luna 2. So <laughs> it's like the, the, um, yeah, the difference... Uh, between how uh, you know this regulated space and deregulated or unregulated space is treated is is mm. glaringly obvious. The biggest straw that broke the camel's back was their sell coin. Um, it was designed to provide liquidity by making a token described by Machinsky as a wheel of fortune that keeps on giving. Do you remember that game Spin show? Spin it again. <laughs> <laughs> What's it going to be? Whoa. Uh, uh, <laughs> How many red flags do you want? Here? Oh my god, it's like a, it's like one of those tacky Vegas games, isn't it? I mean, I'm just like, woohoo, we're going again. How much money is it going to spit out this time? <laughs> oh no, nothing. You've lost. <laughs> oh no, everything's gone to zero. Uh, try uh, again next week. That's um, so funny. What a great line. <laughs> the only thing is, with the current bear market, less people started trading sell right. coin. Uh, mixing some FUD and explains why sales started dipping. Mm. Uh, 
As of writing this script, Sell is sitting at around 59 cents, well below its usual average $3 mark, but higher okay. than its lowest point of around 17 cents. Right, okay. So I guess combine that with recent hacks, which uh, lost them about $120 million. Uh, they've got a payout for the withdrawals. They've had the collapse in price of their Sell coin. Uh, it, I mean, it looks like it looks like they're in big trouble, and of course, they've still frozen withdrawals for for users. So, uh, it's not looking good, is it? I want to say a big thank you to Yield App for sponsoring this podcast. Now, we may be in the midst of a bear market, but that's no reason to stop earning on your digital assets. Yield App allows you to earn daily compounding interest on the biggest digital assets at the click of a button. YieldApp is a licensed fintech company built by a team with a strong background in traditional finance. YieldApp offers instant asset conversions, fiat on-ramp, auto compounding and security features such as activity log, transaction history and more. Simply deposit your digital assets and click to start earning daily rewards. And you can earn up to a thousand of their native token, YLD, by referring your friends to Yield App. You will also automatically join their monthly referral competition for a chance to win massive prizes. Today, we have a special offer for our listeners. Go to yield.app forward slash crypto pulse and sign up for an account to enter a giveaway with a chance to win up to 3,000 YLD tokens. To pay back money for withdrawal, Celsius started taking out loans. Okay, so this is the the slippery slope now. Mm. But since it's on the blockchain, people can track whenever Celsius was taking out these loans to pay for these withdrawals, (laughs) which is actually like a really amazing thing, isn't it? Because like in Mm. the traditional banking sector, there's been so many things that have happened over the last several decades. You don't see any of it play out, whereas here you do. Um, So it's a good thing for the retail investor and for the individual to make their own informed decisions but combine that that um, traceability and transparency to a certain extent with speed of information over things like twitter no wonder Mm. this thing has started to take a nosedive really quickly yeah uh, absolutely yeah it's a bit of a double-edged sword isn't it although Mm. I, i agree i think being able to see what's happening and uh, seeing these organisations taking out loans to cover withdrawals is a f- is a feature of decentralised finance, not a bug. And actually, it should encourage people, or it should encourage the founders of these businesses to manage their money in a in a in a more efficient way. Um, so the YouTuber Coffeezilla described it as a vicious cycle that Celsius would run out of liquidity to pay out these yields on withdrawals. They would take out loans to pay for these withdrawals. Twitter users would tweet out that FT. X uh, just gave uh, 38,000 Ether, or which equates to about 170 million in tether to Celsius, and FUD would start to set in, meaning more and more people would withdraw. It's going to be interesting to see what happens. Um, it also leaves question marks over other platforms that are of a similar ERC. BlockFi, I know, has sort of come into the firing line who do a very similar thing, mm. although their yields are much, much lower and, and seem to be a little bit more sustainable. Um, the CEO of that business actually put out a um, a tweet thread. A tweet thread? <laughs> a Twitter thread. He put out a Twitter thread this week. Uh, just saying that they, it's not something that they would normally comment on, but due to market conditions, he felt that he needed to make a statement. And actually, they said that they're they're pretty well insulated from this. They are protected and users' funds are completely safe, but they are reducing their yield overall, which I think is probably a sensible thing to do. Yeah, I, I think so. Um, yeah, I've, I've known about BlockFi for a while and it's kind of got that um, blue chip vc type feel to it and, mm. and, and i would imagine and they've got some they've got some trad experience in there um and they probably just a little bit better at risk management really but this is yeah. the problem when you've got these huge yields it is unsustainable and we've seen that on some of like the complete DeFi platforms you know i won't i won't name it but we've mentioned it on the show previously and we mm. we, we we bought into some of it with some with some risk capital 
and it's worked out very very poorly um yeah. because <laughs> you know as soon, as soon as it's like the domino effect isn't it as soon as one starts to fall the trickle down effect in this in this space is um unfortunately um just gonna make things spiral out of control i think this is like round one of DeFi in some ways and what it's shown to me is that we have to have regulation and michael saylor bringing him up again mentioned on twitter this week that he said the next generation of DeFi will be built around um the bitcoin protocol so of course um and I was thinking about that earlier on and I thought, do you know what? He's probably right there. He's probably right. Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, Bitcoin has consistently proven itself to be the most uh, resilient of all of the blockchain assets. And it is, of course, the original. I think a lot of the regulatory framework is being built around Bitcoin specifically. You know, they want to get this thing into pension funds, hedge funds. So I I, I tend to agree. Um, the Lightning Network is a great example of something which has been built on Bitcoin as a payment system, which is working yes. brilliantly in places like El Salvador. You know, people are able to make yeah. payments at lightning speed. So whilst Bitcoin will never be a layer one payment system, you can build things on top of it and the infrastructure can be created to turn it into anything, really. I, I, I think this is going to be super interesting for the, uh, the next round of uh, innovation in this space, for sure. So I think I'd like to move on to our next story sure. for this week's show, which is uh, the Kraken story. Um, so this is the one about the CEO denouncing woke activists in his corporate culture. Seems like <laughs> like a cra like a crazy, pretty toxic situation going on there. So on Wednesday, cryptocurrency exchange Kraken announced that it continued to hire over 500 roles in various departments uh, amid a market downturn. And at the same time, they released a 4,000 word, 11 page culture document outlining Kraken's libertarian philosophical values. Um, that includes prohibiting employees from calling speech toxic or hateful or racist or xenophobic or unhelpful and possibly incorporating firearm and self-defense training into corporate retreats. <laughs> um, yeah, I am... Um Sorry, carry on. <laughs> yeah, so no, the company's post seems to be a sharp rebuke of the kind of progressive policies that we're seeing in Silicon Valley. Um, and and most have sort of taken that stance. I th he says, I think we've developed some really thoughtful policies that might not appease woke activists, but work for the other 99% of the world, Powell wrote. Um, Christina Yee, a Kraken executive, wrote in a Slack post that the CEO company and culture are not going to change in a meaningful way. If someone strongly disagrees likes or hates working here or thinks those here are hateful or have a poor character she said go and work somewhere else well i mean she has a point there to a certain extent but um mm. i mean so i mean where to even begin on this really because okay so silicon valley as a whole is ex extremely leftist and extremely woke and yeah. some of the stuff that goes on there you know, is ridiculous. Um, yeah. So you could look, and I don't really know the characters too much at Kraken, so it's quite hard to assess what their rationale is behind this. Um, but the whole idea of libertarian philosophical values is potentially a good thing. But what they seem to have done here is just remove one thing and then enforce another, which isn't really that philosophy at all. Um, and... I, the cynic in me, thinks maybe this is a bit of a publicity stunt um, to attract different types of talent and to kind of like mm. put their flag in the sand and say, this is what we do. This is how we're different. That's an interesting point. Yeah, I think in a competitive job market where engineers, well, engineers back last year, really difficult to hire and they had to mm. sort of put, put really big salaries in place to attract the right talent perhaps they've gone down the route of saying this is our philosophy and they're attracting people a different way i i agree with what you're saying though i think rather this this doesn't read to me like a libertarian approach it actually sounds like they're trying to create an environment where you can just say anything almost free of consequence which is not the same um you know i think a, a, tr a truly libertarian space does promote freedom of speech um but it doesn't promote uh that you 
that you can use any kind of language you know we should all be striving to be more inclusive and more thoughtful about the words that we use and part of that comes through having an open forum where discussions can be uh, tested by communities of people you know ideas can be stress tested we can figure out which which bits we like which bits we don't like um, and people can make up their own mind I, I absolutely don't believe in um, censorship at all but I have read some of the stuff that's in here and it, it reads to me as though they are actively creating a toxic work environment which seems to be the opposite really of of a libertarian space yeah because you're right about um free speech and there shouldn't be any censorship and to have real diversity you have to have diversity of thought not diversity through um somebody's mm. gender somebody's sexuality somebody's race somebody's hair color somebody's religious views it's mm. it's about neurodiversity to a certain extent um yeah. And, you know, I also don't believe in like quotas that you should kind of like artificially create a company based on an exact percentage of people's demographics because it's, it, it doesn't work. <laughs> it's, 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 it's impossible to do that. But at the same time, you know, if I was working in a company, I'd want to, I'd want to make sure that there were consequences if people were, if their behavior was, was, you know, particularly rude or particularly abrasive or you know racist or something like that you'd want to know that there was some kind of consequence to that and i think the best kind of consequence to it is that social uh, acceptance of what what is what is acceptable and what's not rather than trying to legislate things either way um mm. so i i think some people at kraken have probably got really hacked off with the um the woke culture and have just gone completely the other way um you know almost in spite of it and i think that's kind of a dangerous place sometimes is it's not actually done with particularly good intent it's done with hate for what they don't like so they'll just flip to the other side so um there you go there's the there's the diplomat centrist in me coming out there <laughs> you know i know i'm gonna get splinters up my ass for sitting on the fence sometimes but you know i think the world is quite nuanced um but yeah interesting to see what they've done nevertheless it, it is. And I also think that society is becoming more polarized and a lot of that has been driven by social media. You only mm. have to look at Twitter as an example and, and you know, their sort of approach with uh, censorship completely. Um, and it's, it's come out through um, organizations like Project Veritas. Now, I know they're, they're super right wing, uh, but they, they, they have caught engineers at Twitter saying that essentially we are communists and we actively prevent people from saying things that we feel is out of line with our personal philosophies. Uh, and that's, of course, a very, very dangerous stance for a platform uh, like Twitter to take. And I understand why Elon Musk is is trying to take it down the route that he is. I think his mantra is freedom of speech, not freedom of reach, which I think means that the algorithm shouldn't necessarily promote things that are divisive for the purpose of advertising revenue. Uh, people should be allowed to say whatever they want, but that doesn't mean that it should be amplified to the masses. And people get that confused sometimes, you know, people think that in this world of social media, you, freedom of speech is the same as being able to um, reach huge audiences with your divisive speech. And of course it isn't. You can say whatever you want, but there there should be consequences um, that, are, that are married to that. And it seems like at Kraken they are they're abandoning consequence which i think is dangerous because you you know you shouldn't be able to say something that is xenophobic homophobic racist and for everyone there to go eh, well that's the culture um, because i think you just create an unhappy workforce and when you're trying to build a company that is disruptive and especially in the current economic climate, you know, I think you want to keep your keep your workers happy. What did Elon Musk say? If the far left and the far right are both unhappy, then um, that's a good thing. You know, we, <laughs> yeah, you do. Nobody, the thing is, nobody's ever going to agree with everything that everybody says. That no, is just totally. impossible, especially in yeah. today's age. So should we move on to something a little bit more lighthearted? Yeah. Let's move on to our final segment, which is uh, always a fun one. So this is the weird <laughs> world of crypto. 
<laughs> Not again. All right. Yeah. So what Another have one. we got in store this week? Uh, so this is the boxer. Now I, I, I can't pronounce that name. What's his? You know more about boxing than I do. What's his? <laughs> do I? Right. Well, like one more thing. <laughs> Ma- yeah, Manny Pacquiao. Is it? Let's go for Manny Pacquiao. So, okay. Well, that's what we're going to call him. And I, and I'm sure our listeners will tell me well, that just, I'm completely. Let's just call him Manny. Wrong. Yeah, let's just call him Manny. Okay, so Manny, very famous boxer, is launching an NFT collection. Love that. Love a celebrity launching an NFT collection. Um, This one is in memory of his late Jack Russell, uh, Pac-Man. So <laughs> this is not che- this can't be did, cheap. Like did, why did he go? T- did he go round? Did the dog just like run round a maze, being chased by ghosts, trying to gob- gobble up little balls of goodies or something like that? May- maybe it's a, yeah, it's a good reason to name him Pac Man. <laughs> um, so anyway, like most people that are listening, I am a dog person. I own a dog and have always had dogs. Love them. There is no bond stronger than the one has with their own dog. But of course, dogs don't live as long as we do and we get to a point eventually where we might want to remember our little furry pals um how do we remember them is the question that ex-champion boxer turned filipino politician manny pacao had on his mind for a while and like any other completely sane person he came to the conclusion that he'd like to honor his dog by creating an nft collection and fighting video game (laughs) cool (laughs) Nice. Um, so dubbed Pac-Man the Jack Russell, the cartoonish boxer dog themed NFT collection pays tribute to Pacao's pet Pac-Man, who was accidentally run over by a car in 2020. Oh no. That's really sad. I shouldn't yeah. laugh. Um, it'll <laughs> consist of 9,999 algorithmically generated NFTs with visual and skill-based attributes like strength and stamina. Like the uh, ability so, uh, to push a car away or something. <laughs> Oh, no. <laughs> oh, poor Pac-Man. Um, I would like so, to block the car like Pac-Man. That would work. Yeah. Oh, God. So I'm going to read you. The following paragraph comes straight from the Pac-Man.dog website. I didn't even um, know .dog was a, a, a domain extension uh, that's available. You know what never, we're going to be doing after the show, don't you? Buying .dog websites. Yeah. Um, Doggy yeah so, doggy. 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 Right. So... Here we go. So one sunny afternoon after the accident, Manny and I were sitting in a quiet cafe when I casually introduced him to the idea of the blockchain and all the wonderful things that technology can bring. While elaborating on various technical details, I began to see Manny's face suddenly start to glow ecstatically as if he'd been struck by some life-changing epiphany. Does that mean Pac-Man can be forever? He stuttered with excitement, and so it came to be Manny Pacquiao's very own NFT collection in sweet memory of his beloved Jack Russell Terrier, Pac-Man. Flipping Jack Russell as well, it would be. People have gone nuts. People have just gone completely barking mad, if you'll pardon the pun. I just... It's it's one thing to have a picture of your dog on the wall, which I think mm. most sane people would do, but to actually go ahead and build an entire NFT collection. Oh, so we've actually got in the show notes, thanks for this, Cal, we've got some pictures of the NFTs. I've just been scroll. having a look at them. They do look they do look pretty cool, although they're just probably... shit, aren't they? They're just well, shit. Honestly, it's like all these NFTs are just so so crap. It's why like, would you I get want it. an NFT of this guy's dead dog? And yeah. there's nearly ten thousand of them. And also, why does there always have to be nine hundred ninety? Like, oh, sorry, nine thousand nine hundred ninety nine of them. What what is it with that number? Maybe somebody that's really into the NFT space can no let idea. me know on that. I mean, I did, it, yeah. It, basically, it's 9,999 too many of these NFTs, if you ask me. But it, um, it's, there we go. It's a waste of energy. It's a total waste of energy. There are better things to be doing. I mean, the guy's a politician, for God's sake. Like, go and do something meaningful. I don't, I don't mean to be <laughs> cruel about this, but I'm looking at the artwork, and honestly, it's shit. I wouldn't. I just wouldn't bother buying it. But hey, each to their own. I mean, people do crazy stuff with their dead animals. I actually met somebody once that had their dog taxidermied, which I thought was just creepy. Yeah, that is very that is very <laughs> weird. Well, there you go. That's um, each each to their own. I wonder if so there are nine thousand. Are they on OpenSea? <laughs> Well, I think you go. I think you go to the website Pacman.dog, and uh, they're available to be minted. I don't know if they're free. I think it probably cost you some gas money, but yeah, I wonder if he'll sell out. I wonder how many he'll sell. 
Are there 9,999 people who are as invested in Pac-Man the dog as Pacau is? Yeah, so it does beg the question, would you mint your dead dog to sell it to strangers so they could use it to fight in a virtual arena? Yeah, that sounds fun, actually. That does sound fun. <laughs> Okay, well, uh, we'll, uh, we'll, yeah, I hope your this dog had game. a long, healthy life in front of, in front of him, and uh, that yeah. Uh, we, we, yeah, that you never create a Milo NFT. But if you did, I might buy one of those. <laughs> yeah, he's a he's a good boy. I mean, he's also he's also very young, so you know, got a lot of time ahead of him. I hope. <laughs> okay, well, what an episode! I mean, I feel that's been a bit of a roller coaster from um, yeah the the heat of Celsius through to the anti woke culture uh, in crack and right the way through to the weird world of crypto. So um, it's been really fun to do this. It's gone on a little bit longer than usual, but I think, mm. I think we both had a lot to say this week, which is uh, we did. always good when you're doing a podcast, you want a lot to say. Uh, Absolutely. So we've, got some, we've got some cool stuff coming up. We've got some interviews lined up very soon with some very, very big guests. Um, we've we got... Marshall, who is the CEO and co-founder of Proton and Metal Pay, so that's oh my god, we've been we've been asked by so many of that community to get them on the show, so that's going to be happening in the in the next few weeks. Um, and we also have our first author of the series coming on. Until next time, oh, that's a terrible thanks for ending. tuning in. <laughs> <laughs> Catch you soon. We hope you enjoyed this episode. It would mean the world to us if you could leave a review wherever you're listening. This really does help and allows other people to find us online. You can keep up to date with new releases of the podcast by subscribing and following us on Twitter or Instagram for the latest crypto related news. Information provided by Crypto Pulse via this podcast, website, social media channels and any other medium does not constitute financial advice, investment recommendations or any other type of advice whatsoever. The Crypto Pulse team are not professional financial advisors. Trading and purchasing cryptocurrencies do carry risks and anybody wishing to partake in such activities should seek professional advice.